Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy wend your way. So let's move to kind of personal questions that people have asked about you guys, <laughs> your history, your intentions. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the biggest misperceptions? Do you ever feel misjudged? Yes. Uh, there have been stories that uh, we've stolen things out of the church archives, which we never have. Like I told you on that microfilm, I just made a copy from their reader. There was nothing illegal in that. Uh, so there's been some misunderstanding on some things that way where we've been accused of stealing stuff that we never did. Uh, I know some other people who... Uh, got things through conniving ways, but we never told anyone to or endorsed anyone. I know one fellow at BYU was taking microfilms out of the BYU library and substituting another roll of film in it and then sending the microfilm out to have it copied and then go back and switch it back. And so some things that came out came through that kind of a process. But we had nothing to do with that. Um, we may have benefited by it. We may have used some of the photographs later, but it wasn't something that was our method. It wasn't our way of approaching things. We had people come to us and say, uh, hey, I can go through the temple. I got a, a temple recommend. I can go through and get the latest ritual. And we always told people, no, we'd rather not. We know enough about the temple. We don't need someone to go through and get a new copy of it for our means we had enough research on it to show our problems with it uh, we tried to discourage that sort of thing now i know new name noah has filmed the whole thing and has it all up on the internet and it's certainly fascinating to watch but again it was not anything i would have encouraged or told someone to do i i troubled by that approach but we've been anything that happens that way we get accused of the being behind it all that we have uh, done some way, something dishonest that way. But sometimes you'll print things yes. that were obtained inappropriately. Well, like the Eugene England letter. Yeah, if you want to say that was inappropriately, yeah. So uh, one thing that's got some people upset was the when we printed um, Mike Quinn's paper on being a Mormon historian. We felt that was in the public domain. He gave a public talk. He distributed copies of the talk. A friend of ours wrote to him, I don't remember if she paid money, but she wrote for a copy of the talk that he sent to her. And then we ended up printing it. We felt that that was in the public domain at that point. So, I mean, yeah, it made Quinn mad. Uh, and in hindsight, uh, maybe it would have been better not to have done that. But it, we didn't feel at the time that we were doing anything illegal. One could argue it wasn't morally right, but I don't think you can argue it was illegal. <laughs> what do you think about it being immoral? That gets back to the whole thing on the whistleblower in any kind of corrupt organization. Do you believe anyone ever has a right to be a whistleblower? Uh, and I'm for whistleblowers. So I, I would defend the moral uh, value of the greater good for instance, on like on the tobacco industry. Yeah, sure. There, I think there are times, well, in, in any industry, you always have the corporate headquarters hiding stuff from the lower guys. When anything went amuck, you got to hide it. And then you have a whistleblower that brings it out. We viewed our situation with the Mormon church in that kind of a relationship, that the corporation had been dishonest and the stockholders had a right to know what really was going on. Do you embrace the term anti-Mormon? No, I think it's I think it's a very it's like saying nigger. It's a way to demean someone, to ridicule them, to make them nothing, to have no account. So that uh it imply it sounds like I'm opposed to all the people. I'm not opposed to I'm not anti-Mormon, I'm anti-Mormonism. I don't believe in the Mormon Church. I don't think it's a uh, a value significant enough to keep it going just because some families enjoy it and they uh, and 
like reading the Book of Mormon. I, I think there are bigger issues here than just whether someone enjoys it. So yes, I'm uh, fighting against the church institution, but it's because I value the members right to freedom of information. They have a right to know and make their own decisions. The members aren't making decisions, informed decisions. People being converted in are not given a fair shot at making an informed decision on what they're joining. They're given a candy-coated, very simplistic presentation. They don't know what they're really in. I have I talk to the people after they join that call me up and say, I didn't know they believed in plural gods. I didn't know, I didn't understand this whole polygamy thing. I didn't understand that men could still get sealed to more women. What is this? So I deal with the aftermath of the people that find it out after they've joined, after they spent five years. I had one couple call me up specifically on the polygamy issue and they were out in Ohio area or something. When they joined the church, they had specifically grilled the missionaries on polygamy. It's a dead issue, it never happens. That was just for when there was more women than men in Utah. Once they took care of that imbalance, it was dropped and it's all dead, it's all gone. Okay, five years later, they're sitting in some uh, gospel doctrine class um, and something comes up about section 132 and polygamy and then Someone asks the question about, uh, oh yeah, well that reminds me, I was doing genealogy for my uh, dad and uh, uh, we were trying to figure out who to seal the kids to and who to seal to which women and all this stuff. And it all comes out that, oh, well yeah, you can have another wife sealed to you. Yeah, your, your dad that was married to your mom and she died and he marries this other lady and uh, he's sealed to her in the temple. Yeah, he can have both women. And there's no worry about who the kids are sealed to because it's just gonna be one big family. And they're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you guys told me there wasn't any polygamy. This sounds like you're talking polygamy in heaven. So next thing I know, I get a call from this distraught couple. What, are, what have we got ourselves into? The missionaries swore them down there was no polygamy. That we would not have joined if we had known that they still had polygamy on the books, that they still believed a man could be married to more than one woman, that they would live in, in heaven. And they were outward, they wanted to sue the church. They called me because they wanted to know the name of a lawyer. They wanted to sue the church for misrepresentation. All right, so whistleblowing. Yeah. Um, and not an anti-Mormon. No. Critic of Pro Mormonism. Pro-truth. I, I would own up to being a critic of Mormonism, but I don't think that anti-Mormon serves any purpose. Okay. Other it's than a to pejorative a term. Okay. Um, some people have criticized your tone or your approach. Um, someone sent me uh, some criticisms that I believe Leonard Arrington is uh, quoted to have made that sometimes you guys have taken quotes out of context. Sometimes uh, Gerald or you would write in caps or underline that some people view as kind of unprofessional or unscholarly. Um, and said that, you know, these people aren't highly educated, so it's just not a really credible scholarly enterprise. What would you say to those types of criticism? Okay, in the 1960s, we're typing on a typewriter, doing a mimeograph. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't own the Deseret News, so yes, it was unprofessional, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, and Gerald had uh, really got sold on capitalizing and underlining. And I will concede that, yeah, it has an unprofessional look to it. I'll confess that we don't have a good education. But we're dealing with a bigger issue than that. And as far as taking the quotes out of context, we give more context than anybody who quotes bigger chunks of text than we do. <laughs> so, I mean, what, I got to put the whole book in there? <laughs> what does it take to be in context? <laughs> you read any scholar that you want to pull off the shelf, he'll give you half a sentence quote that he's put in with his synopsis of what that paragraph was about. They don't give you the, very rarely will they give you a block of text from something they're quoting from. Okay, when I read through the different scholars' books, I've read the books they're quoting from. I don't need the whole chunk of text because they say that phrase, I know what they're talking about. But Joe Blow down the street doesn't. He, how is he gonna evaluate that 
summary of the guy's paragraph with one sentence out of it. We had so many people in the 60s saying, you guys are just lying, you're taking it out of context, you don't know what you're talking about, you didn't prove your point, you only had one quote on that, fine. Okay, we're going to beat you at that game, we're going to give you so many quotes you can't deny it, and we're going to give you so much of the quote that you can't deny it. So yeah, it's unprofessional, we weren't trying to write history, we're trying to write a polemic of why not to believe Mormonism and go back to Christianity. All right. Um, I also read that Leonard Arrington accused you guys of making the church scared so that they limited access to the archives and that in a way you caused a chill over, you know, Mormon history. By but you're shooting the messenger again. Who's the real problem here? And the church at the time would say, oh, if we let everyone into the church archives, they could make up just all kind of stories. No, the way you stop all kind of stories is make the archives open to everybody. Because then you would know if I was taking it out of context. The way to secure your history is everyone access, access and they know if you're telling the truth. So I think they're, they're barking up the wrong tree. That's their, Arrington couldn't say anything to, to say, my church is a, a, the problem. So let's shoot the messenger. Right. Um, the number one question we received about you <laughs> is around your your um, maintenance of beliefs in Christianity. Yeah. And basically the argument is you're willing to criticize everything up until the New Testament, but you're not willing to apply the same scrutiny to the New and the Old Testament. So there's... Well, you they know, don't know that. They don't know what I've read or what I've studied or what we've gone through. Gerald did a whole book on uh, uh, the evolution of theory of man and all because of his father. Now, I mean, there's only a few copies out there, but uh, he read everything he could get hold of on all those different topics. I've read extensively on uh, New Testament manuscripts and historical items on the Bible. Yeah, okay, so are we going to say that the only people that get to write religious history are unbelievers? Because are we going to say anyone that still believes could not have read the documents? Because I come out with a different answer, it makes me not have looked at them. So I think it's unfair. Okay. I don't think we're on the same, we are not on the same kind of a, a investigation. It's not an equal playing field to compare the Book of Mormon to the Bible. And we talked about that. So let me just go through a bunch of issues. So okay. Adam and Eve, you know, 6,000 years ago, literal Adam and Eve. I do not uh, feel uh, constrained to have to be confined by a 6,000 year earth. I can accept an old earth. I would be uh, in the category of intelligent design. Okay. What about Noah and the ark and global flood? I would be more likely to think in terms of a local flood, uh, well, I mean, a big flood, but but when you say the whole world, I don't know that reached Peru. And all the animals? Uh, for the area. I, I don't know. Okay, it's... okay, okay. <laughs> what about all the genocide in the Old Testament and all that awful stuff? You're dealing with a political situations where you have nations. Uh, uh, well, this nation's following this God, this nation's following that God. I mean, that's just the way warfare worked in those days. So that's people, not God. The genocide? Uh, no, I would say it was God included. I think God had his hand protecting Israel. Okay. But can you, can you see how... I don't think you can move back to Old Testament times and judge it by our day. Right, but, but if you can say there's still value in the story of Adam and Eve, there's still value in the story of There could have been Noah. an Adam and Eve. I'm not saying there wasn't, but right. it, I'm not saying there weren't people before them. <laughs> I guess some people would say there's a, a leniency or an openness to, there's a flexibility for, that you're showing to the Old and New Testament that you won't necessarily apply to Mormonism. Because we're dealing with history of real people. There really are Israelites, and there really is a Jerusalem. Well, some say... There's, there's no proof nothing for the Book of Mormon. No, but some say there's really no proof that Moses existed, that Abraham probably never existed. You're dealing with existed. ancient texts. You're dealing with history that uh, we don't have the access to the history of the Old Testament like we do for the New. But does that make it less credible or more? 
Which? Uh, the, the Old Testament? No, the, I don't. We have less documentation even for the Old Testament than the Book of Mormon. I'm saying it's hard to resolve the issues. Which means you're more inclined or less inclined to believe? I'm th saying that there are unresolved questions that I don't think we can answer with the limited amount of information we have. But shouldn't that incline you towards disbelief since there's not enough information? Not because when you get closer into historical time frame, then we have stuff we can check out and it does lead to belief. For you? For me. Okay. And same with the New Testament. There, mm -hmm. there are scholars that say that, I think Ryan Roos wrote that like Second Peter was a forgery, that there are all sorts of problems with the historicity, the different accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the fact that they were handed down multiple generations orally before but they, they were But they weren't. Well, they weren't. You have a fragment of the book of John at in the 30s, uh, 130, fragment of um, John 17, I think it is. To have a fragment of John in 130 shows that it was an established text because it doesn't show up at Jerusalem. It's down the Mediterranean. So... It shows it's a circulated text already. We aren't talking about this long history. You have um, John 1.1 1, 1 in 170 or 80 AD, which by the way refutes the inspired revision because the in the beginning was the words exactly the same. Of course it's Greek, but I mean, it, it's the same text. So that I see the history of the New Testament as sufficient for me to believe it's true. Um, what scholars accept of Paul's writing places you, and they do accept half of Paul's writing, they, you, that places you back into um, the 40s and 50s. The Gospels are written after Paul. They're written in the 60s, 70s. And I know some scholars want to make it much later in that, but I think there are arguments for why it all has to be written before the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't have a problem accepting the historicity of the New Testament. What about the sexual deviance in the Old Testament? Why not give Joseph a break if you're going to give Abraham and Isaac and Jacob breaks or David or Solomon? Why is it bad if Joseph does it, but if Solomon and David and Abraham do it, it's okay? Well, I didn't say it was okay. It's in the Bible. Uh, well, it's in the, a lot of stuff's in the Bible. Slavery's in the Bible. That's what the South used to use as a justification for it. I don't see it that way. I. Uh, you're not a. You're not a inerrant, inerrancy type of person. Well, it depends on. That's a big topic, and it's very nuanced how you define that word. Okay. Um, but for you, a prophet can. You're not necessarily saying everything a prophet does in the Old Testament's okay. The Bible doesn't say that. Right. The Bible doesn't paint a glowing picture of David taking Bathsheba. Right. We read about it. We know about his adultery. It isn't whitewashed. It's right there. Right. Uh, it's not when Noah gets drunk, it's right there. Right. So, And when Abraham uh, lies about Sarah, uh, you're told about it. Right. And it doesn't say God told him. That's Joseph Smith's idea in the book of Abraham to say that God told him to lie. The Bible doesn't say that. It's just Abraham covering himself, that he tells her, oh, just tell him you're my sister. Uh, so I don't see them, I would like with David, for him to, to have Uriah killed and to take Bathsheba was truly wrong. But he repents of that. I can deal with repentance. Joseph didn't repent. He didn't sin and then repent. He went to these women and said, God told him to do this repeatedly. So it's a whole different avenue then when I see men doing, well, and besides that, polygamy in the Old Testament was never a religious right. It was uh, a cultural thing. Uh, a king came into office, he got the harem before him. I mean, this was all just the way society ran, but there's nothing in there to say God told anyone to do it. So you're saying once you're kind of lying that God said to do it, that's an, that's an extra level of evil for you. Well, yeah. Well, I think it's evil for, I think David was uh, totally wrong to have Uriah killed to take Bathsheba, and he right. sinned. But what obviously. about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's polygamy? And... They, they were going along with the cultural norm of the day. 
I'm not saying they were evil for their taking plural wives. It was the cultural situation of the day that God didn't tell them to do. It was just the way the culture went. Okay. But do you, do you, do you feel like you give the Bible more of a pass than you do Joseph Smith and Mormonism? I think I get... willing to give them more leeway? I think it deserves more leeway. So it's a double standard that you... That you feel I don't good about. think it's a double standard. But you said it deserves more leeway. You're dealing with historical items too far removed to know enough to make judgments on some things. I don't think that's the same as with Joseph Smith when you got all the documentation on exactly what he did and what happened. Right. Okay. Um, where do you go to church? Discovery Christian Community. Where's that? Ninth East to, to um, 60th South. You like it? Yeah. Good pastor, good singing. All right. Um, what about some of Christian doctrines? Do you believe that everyone who doesn't accept Jesus is going to hell? If God wants to let everybody in, that's okay with me. But his word says that the few there be that enter in. So I, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to name the name of Christian, if I'm going to say I follow Christ, Christ seems to have left me with that position. Does not disturb you though? Yes. I Isn't Joseph's ways better where everybody gets in? Do we just go by what's better? <laughs> then if we're going to go by what's better, then we should go new age, throw all religion out, and and just go pet cats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what a lot of people do. Like over half of you know ex Mormons become agnostic and atheists. Your Mormons become atheists. There's a whole bunch of Mormons out there that are becoming Christians. You just don't run into them. Oh, me. Well, yeah, your podcast, your surveys and that, you, you, you are in contact with that segment more than you're, in, as far as I know, in contact with those that leave and become Christian. Well, there's certainly some. And even in my survey, there's some. But, but in, in, our, in our studies, it's, it's at least half that leave, you know, God and, and Jesus. Well, I'd probably together. grant you half. Yeah, well, that's, that's all our study showed. Um, but you've stuck around. How do you explain that? What what kept those dominoes falling for you? That that do you think that that you know for others they've they've fallen? God and Jesus. Well, what do you base your beliefs on now? On the New Testament, I can accept it as a historical record of real events, and that uh, there really was a Jesus. Historians concede there was really a Jesus. The question is, did he raise from the dead? And I accept that the New Testament is sufficient witness that something happened that significant that gave rise to the movement. Uh, I don't know how to explain the rise of Christianity outside of everyone at least firmly believing it happened, whether you want to say that it didn't happen or not, I think the first go around of Christians had to believe the resurrection had to happen, or it had never got off the ground. So, um, you know, uh, I guess um, it, it sounds like you're kind of basing that on the, the spiritual experiences you had that you mentioned in the late 50s. Kind of the it's same type of burning in the bosom and... only, But only because there was historical evidence to go with it. It wasn't isolated on just feeling. I did go and... St now, granted, when I first came to Christ, I had not read critically on the Bible. I have since then. I have gone through periods when I wondered if there's a God. I think anyone that, that gets to be 73 has seen enough bad things in life to think, oh my God, where is he, you know, that this happened. So I, I view my faith as a much more grounded faith than that day in my front room when I prayed the sinner's prayer. I don't think it's any different. It's more informed. So I'm committed to the Christian message. I believe it's viable. I think historically it's viable. I can't prove Jesus rose from the dead. You can't prove there's not a God. I mean, there's just certain things that, that just don't fall into that kind of an equation. Do you characterize your beliefs as knowledge or just hope or faith? 
Well, faith I feel like and you have hope. Certainty? Do you I feel don't, like you have certainty. I feel like I have certainty, but I don't know. I'd say knowledge. Uh, that's uh, that's getting back to my grandma saying, you know, right. uh, believe, not know. Uh, I'm troubled by people that know everything. Well, what about all the Muslims and all the Buddhists and all the other religious traditions that? feel the same way about their faith that you do about yours? How do you reconcile? To me, the Muslims are just like the Mormons. They got a one-guy prophet that invented their scripture that an angel supposedly brought to him, and I don't see it any more credible than the Book of Mormon. But, but Christianity has some guy raising from the dead. Like, what's credible about that? Well, you've got... And healing blind people and lame and, you know... I've seen healings, and I, I believe that there is a power there that does heal. It doesn't happen all the time. Mormons say they believe in healings. It doesn't happen all the time for them either. Uh, but I, I believe that I have seen enough of God's working that for me, I can believe there is a higher power. There is a God that answers prayer. Now I'm going to cry. <laughs> Taking care of Gerald for eight years. There were a lot of problems with that that I can't go into, but it was a hard time. But I feel God was there. Gerald and I grew closer than we ever had. We leaned on God more than we ever had. I felt God met us in that in ways that we hadn't experienced before. So I'm, yeah, I'm convinced that there's an afterlife and I'm gonna see Gerald again. And I can't prove it to anyone. I had an experience, does <laughs> this a, sound like Mormonism? Um, I don't believe in people coming back from the dead, but Gerald came back to the dead to me. And I even went and talked to my pastor about it because it doesn't fit my theology. <laughs> uh, but shortly after he died, I mean a couple days later, he came to me in my bedroom and he stood before me and, and I went to him and I put my hand on the side of his face and it was warm. And I put my hand on his arm, and it was solid. And I said, Gerald, I know you're dead, but it's so good to see you. And he just smiled at me, and then he was gone. And I talked to my pastor about that. I said, I don't fit my theology. Because I don't believe in that. But it happened. And he says, well, why do you think it happened? What did you take from it? And I said, I feel... The God let me have that experience to know that he was at peace and that if everything was okay. I could go forward in life knowing that he was okay. So, I mean, I, don't, I was already Christian. This I'm not basing my Christianity on this. But it's just one of the experiences that says to me, I know there's a God. I know there's an afterlife. I know Gerald somewhere. I don't know where. And that I'll see him again. And that Christ made it possible? And yes, and Christ made it possible through the atonement and resurrection. And that sounds so much like a Mormon saying, yes, but my grandma came to me in the temple and asked me to do her temple marriage. Uh, so I don't use it as a proof. I don't go public with that story. Now I have with you. <laughs> uh but that's part of the spiritual reality for me. But it isn't the reason I became a Christian. It isn't, it's only as part of my Christianity. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, when people, do people come to you for advice? Oh, yes, every week. Every I week. I spend hours every week counseling people. And what do you tell them? It depends on what their struggle is. Do you ever tell them to stay in the church? I have told people not to take their name off of the rolls yet. Uh, if it's a mate that fears the mate will divorce them, I tell them then you maybe need to go slower. You're 
pressing too hard. You do, You want to keep the marriage intact. You want to keep your kids in a family with both parents. Uh, and you, you've got to work at a slower pace because sometimes, you know, and I know that when I first came out of Mormonism, I wanted to pin everyone to the wall, made a lot of enemies. Uh, I says, you, you, you have to be more subtle. And so, yeah, I've, I've talked to people that way about, and some of my Christian friends would say, uh, you know, you got to leave, you got to do it right immediately, take your stand immediately. Yeah, we took our stand. But Gerald and I did it together. I don't think I could have done it alone. If my husband had not been on the same page, I don't know that as a brand new married person, I would have had the strength to have done that. I couldn't have stood against the pressure from family and neighbors and other Mormons uh, that was put on me. I mean, at 18 and 19, I wasn't strong enough. But together, we could do that. So, yeah, I try... I. I tell them, try to keep the marriage, not to play games. You shouldn't uh, lie or misrepresent. But if it means backing off, if it means going to church every other week or, you know, negotiate some sort of lesser activity uh, to keep the relationship because your kids need you in that home. So keep the family together. Yeah. But I don't advocate doing it on a false pretense. So be honest. Yeah. That's what you tell people. Do you ever have people kind of in, have you ever had people in leadership positions or people of influence kind of reach out to you privately? I did years ago, and I can't go into the details, but it was someone from a foreign country that the church had paid for their education, and they had risen up in the ranks of the church, and by the time... Uh, they got higher up. They realized it wasn't true, but they felt they couldn't leave. And I thought, how sad that they're going to spend out their life in something they know isn't true. I couldn't have done that. And I've I've talked to bishops that don't believe. I've talked to state presidents that don't believe. Um, you know, elders quorum presidents. Uh, they don't believe it, and they're playing along because of their wife and kids or their job, their inheritance. I know people that left and got disinherited. I know people that left, and their kids won't let them see their grandkids for fear that they'll spread apostasy germs. So I talk to all these different people, uh, and, and it's very sad. So much of it, our problems the church puts on them. I mean, I hold them responsible for a lot of the breakups and the marriages. They're, they're now talking more about being nicer to each other. But in the past, the church has counseled mates. I've lost count of the number of people that have told me that when I left the church, they told my wife or my husband to divorce me, to get someone to go through the temple so they have an eternal ceiling. And I think that's heartbreaking. How could any church tell you that it would be better off for the family to divorce. I don't think any kids are better off with it. You know where they get that from? Jesus said, I'm here to separate mother from son. Well, to take a stand for Christ, but that's not saying divorce him. I think you can take a stand for Christ and not divorce. <laughs> I think you can be a loving Christian mate. But you can see how someone could interpret Christ's words to say he's come to separate. Oh, Family. sure, and the atheists make all those kind of arguments. I don't think they're valid arguments against Christianity. Because that's not the tone of they're Christianity. They're misinterpretations. Right. Because Christ's about love, you're saying. Yeah. Well, he's all for the union of the husband and wife, not to dissolving it. What do you think about those who stay in as semi-believers or non-believers, but they just they feel like they want to make a difference from within? They They feel like... It, there's good there. It's culturally good. You know, people's lives are blessed. And so they're going to just be a part of it, even as non-believers. Well, it depends on if you believe there's any real truth out there. If we're just going to go agnostic and say, well, it doesn't matter what I believe, but this is as good a place as any to land. It does good. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, then you can believe anything you want. And then I get the, if, if you really believe that, then the, yeah, that makes sense to stay. And you pet cats. And to pet cats, you okay. know, be All nice right. to the dog. Uh, <laughs> but 
if there, if we are going to claim any part of Christianity, I think it it draws a a stand. If we're going to embrace Christianity, it's disrespecting the founders of Christianity to take the easy road. These are people that died for their faith. It was that important to them to stand up and be counted. So I think there's a point as Christians we have to walk away when we see it isn't true. Uh, or at least drop activity. When I say walk away, I don't want people walking away from marriages, but uh, to disengage, to stay with the basis that it tells other people it's okay. I'm not troubled. I'm not troubled by my religion being started by an adulterer and a liar and a magician. Uh, that none of those things matter then what are we saying to our families about ethics or truth or the value of anything when nothing's worth standing up for? Nothing's worth dying for. The early Christians thought it was worth dying for. Um. But I also understand it's a hard thing. I mean, when people come and talk to me about this, I don't berate the struggle it is for them or the problem. I mean, it truly is a problem. I recognize that. But there comes a point when one has to take that stand. May not be the day you first figure it out, but I think there's a point at which God calls you out that you cannot be a part of it anymore. Some say the church is making positive changes. What do you think? Well... To me, it's like there's two groups leading the church. You got the Bidner true believers over here. Bednar? Bednar. Okay. Who I assume is a true believer. And what's the other guy's name? Tad Callister? Um, one of the 70s or something. Anyways, I, I think there's the true believer camp. And then there are the fellows that know there's real problems and it's better than anything out there, so we're okay to keep it going. But they don't believe it in the same way. And I don't know who's going to win. <laughs> because I think you see different strains of that in different things. So you get Uchtdorf talking about we need to be more conciliatory and yeah, we've done some bad things and all that kind of stuff. And then you get Bidner up there, it's all true. You know, so it's like there's two different camps. So does Packer take the lead of the true believers, or is it uh, going to go down at, it to somebody that's of a more liberal accepting bent? I don't know. But I don't see, for instance, how Mormonism could move into the mainstream as long as it man maintains its books of scripture. Uh, by embracing the Doctrine and Covenants especially and the, the Pearly Great Price, it locks you into a doctrinal system that will separate you from Christianity. The Book of Mormon doctrinally may not separate you as much, but the very fact of claiming Scripture will. The idea that, uh, to me, one of the most blasphemous things you could do would be to invent Scripture. If there's a, really a God... For you to invent a scripture, how blasphemous would that be? So to expect Christians to embrace a church that they see being founded by a guy that invents scripture, how can we respect that? They're trying, the Mormons are trying to back away from plural gods. <sighs> But they don't do it honestly. They don't come out and say, Joseph was wrong. We need to scrap that idea. And they kind of finesse it all. That's not really what he meant. We don't understand. And, well, we all understood until a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I understood it. <laughs> uh, what about the church reaching out to evangelicals? That should make you happy. You, you, no, a, week, I, a week at BYU doesn't go by when some evangelical minister doesn't give some keynote address at BYU now. And I'm uh, troubled by that because I think 
I think the Christians mean well on their side, but I don't think they see how they're being used by the Mormons to gain credibility. I don't see the Mormons truly moving to Christianity the way the evangelicals would hope. As long as Mormonism maintains the temple ritual is essential, you cannot move into mainstream Christianity because you're saying there's something more to the gospel. There's more. Christ didn't do enough on the cross. That there's another element that you have to have to be right with God. That's really non-biblical. That's non-biblical. So uh, I know that, uh, oh, who's uh, Millet and different ones down at BYU, Robinson and that, have written on things to try to make Mormonism sound more Christian. Uh, but if they're on staff at BYU, they're believing Mormons, or at least they have to pretend to be believing Mormons, and I assume they're all wearing their garments, which tells me that they're trusting in that temple ritual to do something more for them than Christ could do. And that's where I draw the line. I say, you can't be truly trusting in the grace of Christ if you're going to attack on temple ritual. When you think about Joseph Smith Papers Project, Rough Stone Rolling, which the church sold, um, the Mount Meadows Massacre book, uh, you know, all these essays the church is coming out with now, you could say the church has really become, you know, com coming clean. They're admitting a lot more, and it's yet to be seen what that does. I mean, I think the church works under, or some of the church guys involved in the history stuff, I think they are working under a false assumption that if you just take away the shock value, people won't be disturbed by the information. I would contend, yeah, you, you've eliminated one element of the problem by taking away the shock value, but the information is shocking. You're still stuck with Joseph marrying married women and taking 14-year-old girls. You're still stuck with the church leaders lying about all their past. Joseph Smith lied on the stand what was it, a week or two before he died about polygamy? So that I see a history of lying in the church. That So how much does it help to tell everyone, yeah, we lied, we cheated, uh, yeah, we killed a few people we shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> Doesn't make the people in Arkansas feel a lot better. <laughs> but do you feel like they're doing the right thing? Like, do you Oh, wanna... well, yes, I think that, that it's way late. There should have never been a need for Gerald and Sandra Tanner. The church should have always been open and honest. But there never would have been a Mormonism if they had. Do you feel vindicated? Yeah. Stuff we were saying in the 60s. I can get you out mim mimeograph stuff we put out in the 60s that's now being admitted to on the church website. That when we put it out, we were the worst liars in history. And we got all kind of nasty letters for putting it out. You liars, that's not true. And now you can read it on uh, gospel topics. So how does that make you feel? Well, yeah, I feel vindicated. Does so. it make you feel like yours and Gerald's life was, was worth it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that we pushed the church into honesty. They are, they, well, us and the Internet, but... And we didn't do it alone. I mean, there's all kind of historians in between, and I recognize they all did a lot of great things. Uh, but I don't think the church history would tell me they would have arrived at that point without the prodding. It's just like the tobacco. In do you think the tobacco industry would have ever admitted that they, their cigarettes give you cancer? No. <laughs> without the opposition? <laughs> A lot of people want to know whether you see the amount of disaffection increasing, the rate of disaffection yes. increasing. Yes, absolutely. You've been doing this a long time. Yeah. What's your evidence? Probably half the churches of any stripe in Utah are full of ex-Mormons. That wasn't the true when we left. Well, there weren't as many churches for one thing. Uh so we have seen a real change in the, in the demographics in that regard. Um, I'm in contact with more people leaving than before. I have, um, I mean, it's all anecdotally. I haven't done a survey or anything. 
But uh, yeah, I, I would say there's much more movement. Before it was more centralized, like Utah, California. Now it's all over the world of people leaving. So do you see the church hanging on? Do you see it having some huge schism or crash? What do you see as the future of the church? Okay, let's look at two churches that have gone this road. One is the Herbert Armstrong Church. Is that the Worldwide Church Worldwide of God? Worldwide Church of God. They had a huge university in Pasadena. When their leadership finally said, sorry guys, Armstrong was wrong. We've been misinterpreting the Bible all along. Let's go back to just a normal interpretation of the Bible and scrap all this stuff. There went the university. There went the money. Billions schisms. I'm exaggerating. But, but all kinds of splinter groups came from that. It decimated the church and the finances. And uh, uh, we have a guy that comes to our church sometimes that went through all that, that came out of the Worldwide Church of God. And I mean, he talks in tears about the struggle that was to go through that transition. Uh, it was a very hard thing, but it cost the organization dearly. Okay, you have that example of what happens when you come clean. Then you take the reorganized LDS Church. Of course, they never took Joseph Smith to the same height of veneration as the Utah Church, so it wasn't quite as hard a thing, but it still was uh, very alienating to many reorganized families when the, the leadership started to back away from the absolute claims of Joseph Smith. And then, so then they start all kinds of schisms. So at this point, you go to Independence, Missouri, and you stand on the street corner, and here's the Mormon church with their visitor center. Here's the RLDS temple. Here's the Church of Christ temple lot group. And then uh, on the next block is the big restoration church uh, of the splinter group off the reorganized church. But that's just one example. There's all kinds of splinter groups all over Independence. There's all kinds of splinter groups here in Utah. So the reorganized church, if the Mormon church were watching the reorganized church, what, what do we see happens when you back away from the Book of Mormon's historicity? You see break-off groups. You see the demise of your tithing. It all starts to melt away. So the, if the church keeps going on this effort to put everything out there, at some point, you're going to see some charismatic Mormon guy come up that uh, he's the one mighty and strong come to saw, uh, put the church in order. We've had it in the polygamous for years. I, 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 you know, Every 10 years, you had another one of the one mighty and strong that were going to set the church in order and start another polygamous group. Well, we'll see that in the Utah church. There will be that kind of thing that will happen because if the Uchtdorf crowd continues on this move away from the centrality of Joseph Smith, what, what does that do for all the true believers? I mean, I think of my grandpa, who was fanatic Mormon. He would have been horrified to see today. But you know what? I see a lot of Mormons who are perfectly happy to say, yeah, some mistakes were made, and yeah, we don't understand everything about the Book of Abraham, but Joseph Smith is still a prophet. Book of Mormon is still the Word of God, and we're going strong. And I don't need to know the details. No, there's plenty of Mormons out there that are like, yeah, I know Joseph's got problems. He's still a prophet. Uh, I know there's questions about historicity. The book is true. And this works for me. I, I wonder if the Catholic Church can survive pedophilia scandals, if our church is going to stay strong for the foreseeable future. The Book of Mormon is becoming increasingly totally undefensible. So I think that, yes, Mormons can ignore the problems, but the critical mass is growing uh, of the evidence that says Joseph's scriptures are his invention. And 
I think you're right that the Mormon church will keep going. I don't see the demise of Mormonism. But I think that there are significant numbers of Mormons that will drop away because you can't stop people analyzing. And there will always be those that will try to add up the equation and see the numbers don't come out right. Uh, so we lose a couple percentage points a year in the U.S., but we gain that in spades in Africa and Philippines and Latin America. You're going to end up with a, Europe, uh, uh, a Latin America and African church and less and less of the Americans in it. It's going to totally change the dynamics of the church. In how many years? Um, I don't know. 50 years? 50 years? Okay. Any future areas of research that you think are still ripe for young historians out there that you would point people towards? Um, well, I think the whole Utah period is just opening up. There's, uh, if the church ever opened all the diaries up there, <laughs> I think that there would be all kind of research on how polygamy really worked, how it was lived, how the government really worked, uh, what did the church really do in squelching uh, dissent in different towns, or what I'm sure there's just all kind of studies of the uh, pioneer period up till now that um, has been guarded that will become more and more uh, areas of study. I think we're we're getting pretty well down on the Joseph Smith aspect there, although there are still new things coming up and you hear rumors of different people working on different areas of research. Uh, but I think there's the church has got a lot of headaches in front of them as far as, the, I think, historians getting into the Utah material. They, they've been able to keep the lid on so many important diaries up till now that if they start opening those more and more, it will uh, there'll be all kinds of stuff to study. The church's uh, involvement with the railroad, with the post office, uh, who knows, w with government, with Finances, business. Finances, business. Yeah, uh, and that's going to be a growing concern as more and more people are made aware and think about why isn't there financial disclosure. I find that very troubling. I wouldn't want to go to a church that had billions of dollars and no accountability. No one... Told you anything? All they get up. Their financial statement is: we spent it all like we planned. I don't call that a financial statement. <laughs> right. Um, everyone wants to know what you think about gay marriage, same-sex marriage. I don't know why. I don't. <laughs> I don't like the idea of it being labeled marriage. If they want to have civil unions. Um, and that you know that would be a different thing, but I don't like the idea of defining marriage that way. So you're traditional that way. Yes. Is that based on your interpretation of the Bible? Yeah, and it's my interpretation of life. I, I think the yes, but mainly from a Christian perspective, that marriage was intended for a man and a woman to produce children. I'm not saying gay parents can't raise good kids. I just feel that nature tells us the design, the preferred route. <laughs> is for a husband and wife to raise children. I think that's the ideal for a good, solid upbringing. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of separate but equal isn't good, that, you know, we, we can't have separate water fountains for blacks and whites, separate ceremonies for different classes, you know, in the United States, that that's kind of an American well, I don't think it's fair to make a comparison with race because I think that's such a different I think it's I think it's diminishing the whole problem of race by saying that gay lesbian issues are equal. I don't I think that's diminishing the horror and what went on with uh, our segregation in the United States. Um, so I see them as different it's oranges and apples. 
So you're maybe less comfortable with same-sex sexuality, I guess. Yes. You're not comfortable with that. No. Okay. Uh, I mean, as I say, some of my best friends are gay, you know. I, I'm... <laughs> Uh, I don't profess to understand it. I don't think it's the norm or the intended role that God has for humanity. Uh, Do you think people choose it? I think some may. I, I think there is some sort of a a biological factor to some of it. And I haven't studied and I don't profess any expertise in the field. Um, Mostly it's religious beliefs. That... But mine is based on religion. Okay. okay. Um, what do you think about ordained, the ordained women movement? In Mormonism, I think it's of non-interest to me because I don't believe the, the I don't believe the man, men have the priesthood. <laughs> so why would I want it? You know, I, there's no validity in my mind of Melchizedek Aaronic priesthood. It's just totally non-biblical. Uh, so I I don't see and I never was involved in that because the I rejected the priesthood idea in the first place. And if I was a Mormon woman, I wouldn't want to be in the priesthood. I got enough jobs already. Right. So, and I think that's why some women don't get involved in Mormonism because they got enough to do already. Um, but I don't think that it's anything, I don't think Mormon priesthood is something I think anyone should aspire to. Right. So it's invalid, so why? Why even yeah. argue the point? What about... Female, you know, the Bible, New Testament says women should stay quiet in the church, right? But that was in relation to shouting out in the meeting, asking their husband a question. I don't see that as uh, saying women couldn't be in ministry. When you read about uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla is named before her husband. She obviously was a prominent leader in the early Christian church. So uh, I don't see those statements of Paul as relating to uh, a woman preaching in church. What happens to this place when you're gone? I don't know. <laughs> I'm waiting for the revelation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have plans? No, I don't know what. what <clears throat> no the, will? No. Leaving it to somebody? I, no. Well, this is. Uh, it wouldn't be a matter of a will. It would be a matter of a board decision because I don't own this. This is all nonprofit. So it's all owned now? Fully owned? We are a nonprofit organization. We have a board that would have to make the decision. If I drop dead tomorrow, the board would have to decide what they're going to do with all the assets. They would not go to my family. It was totally separate from my estate. And, and I don't know what this is going to end up being. I, at times, I've looked for someone to work with me. I haven't found the right person. Um, so, so who are you looking for? We got to start some uh, succession planning <laughs> here. You're looking for a Christian. Uh, well, the the ideal list would be a former Mormon Christian with some theological and counseling training. <laughs> All right. So. I guess looking back, would you do anything differently now? Any regrets? Oh, well, now to made Gerald use less capitals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but by the way, we, we don't do that anymore. We've redone a lot of our books uh, to put them into a more normal format. And uh, so that was a thing of technology of the day, as much as anything. Um, well, regrets in the sense that when I first started out, I was too much like a bull in a china cabinet. I, I didn't have enough empathy, and that partly was because of age, uh, that it was easier as two young people leaving the church together and not appreciation appreciating how hard it would be for someone in midlife to do the same thing. So I think in that sense, I'm more empathetic to the Mormon struggle. 
I think the fact that we struggled with the Book of Mormon for two years helped us in being more empathetic to people with the struggle, uh, and as opposed to some of the Christian ministries that were out at the same time, that we understood. Uh, I mean, I still got Mormon family today uh, that were on speaking terms and all that, but uh, we don't talk religion. <laughs> so there would be some areas in that way. I don't know what else I would regret. Uh, Do you guys publish your finances every year? Uh, <clears throat> we don't necessarily publish them, but they're on, uh, what's that, uh, GuideStar, mm -hmm. I think it is, that puts up the 990 forms, and our 990 forms on there every year. What, what do you think your average annual revenue has been just in the past 10 or 20 years? 100 grand, 500 grand, 50 grand? Um, we just did it, and I can't even remember. There is. What's the highest you think it's ever been? I don't know. I I mean, those numbers are, I, I don't operate on the, uh, I'm very impractical. I don't operate on the basis of numbers. So, um, uh, hmm. I mean, it's been between one and 200,000. A year, uh, but I couldn't tell you the breakdown on that. Two hundred thousand. Yeah. A year. On books and stuff. No, most uh, half of it comes in donations. More than half, maybe now, are donations. Just people supporting the, the mm -hmm. efforts. People that that have already left. They've read all they want to know. They know what they want to know about Mormonism that they want to keep up in, us in business to make sure we can help other people. So they moved on from Mormonism, but they want to support our work so we can keep doing it. So we have, through the years, picked up more and more people that have outgrown the need for more books, but still want to support the work. That's pretty good, a couple hundred thousand a year. Yeah. And you just get a subset of that as your salary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I make the whopping, I got a raise this year. And um, so it's probably going to be around uh, 44000 this year. First raise I've taken in 10 years. Mm. So, so never more than fifty grand a year. I've never been more than forty four. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So last year, I think I, I took a bunch of time off last year. So I think I'm... It was 37000 for the year and probably for several years. During Gerald's illness, a lot of years, I didn't make the full uh, salary because of time. I, I mean, I deducted my time off for times when I had to stay home with Gerald, so I didn't. So through those years, I it's been, I don't know how many years I actually drew a full salary. Mm. Uh, but you don't have a retirement, right? No retirement, no. So Social Security and what you get from I have this. Social Security and my salary here. Which is fine. It's plenty for me to live on. Because uh, you own your house. And uh, yeah, everything's paid for. Yeah, that's so, nice. so I'm cool on all that. But there is no retirement program. <laughs> just keep working. That probably keeps you young, right? Well, yeah, it gives me something to do. Uh, it keeps me out of trouble. I'm not down at the mall every day. <laughs> so some would, some would say to you, you've spent your life tearing down an institution that means the world to people. And leading people away from joy and happiness into misery and sin. How would you make your case otherwise? Joseph Smith set up a false religion that led them into something that when it was exposed to be false, led them into heartache and problems. I'm not the problem. The Mormon church is the problem. By them setting up a scenario that to me is falsehood. And... So I don't view it as uh, wasting my life. It's like, it's like saying to the whistleblower on the tobacco industry, do you feel bad your whole life's been spent on a negative pursuit to get that tobacco company? So, and to me, I say, no, I think it was worth the fight. And I didn't lead everybody into this hopeless uh, despair. 
The church made that so they ended up with that hopeless despair. I'm there trying to tell them they need to go on and find faith in God and Christ. There's a beautiful life out there. The grace of Christ is such a freeing thing <clears throat> from the guilt and restrictions of Mormonism to just find grace in Christ. What a beautiful, wonderful thing. You don't have to be on this treadmill to perfection forever. I, I talk to so many people that are worn out that come into me crying, I can't do it anymore. And I said, great, praise God, get off the treadmill. You don't have to, it's all over. It's already been taken care of. So I see it as releasing a lot of people from lives of struggle and guilt uh, and a sense of failure because they didn't live up to all the standards of the Mormon church. They couldn't have six kids, not work, uh, stay home, make bread, uh, <laughs> canned fruit, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's just, uh, I think the Mormon women, well, the men too, but the Mormon women in the past, maybe not so much today, I don't that in touch with their culture, but in the past, they've put them on this terrible perfectionist model of what a good Mormon wife would look like. And it's exhausting. You don't have to do all that. God's not asking that of you. Have you seen people leave Mormonism and find joy? Yes. Yes. Is it rare? No. Where's the Wilders thing? The Lynn and Mike Wilder, the BYU professor that left and became a Christian. Uh, Lynn and her sons, our whole family came out and they're beautiful Christians and they have this video unveiling grace. And it's a very beautiful, inspiring video of this family's story. She had to walk away from the BYU. She was a tenured professor. She now teaches down in Florida. But yeah, great joy. That's just one family. It's an example of many families that are repeated time after time. That's what you've seen? Yes. Carl Wimmer, that was the politician, he's now down in uh, Gunnison area, and a beautiful, happy Christian. Giving up all this political stuff. He's just a uh, policeman, I think, down in the area. Happy as lark, just following Christ. So I guess some people would say you spent your life fighting against something. I think you'd probably, from what I've learned, you'd probably say you were definitely more from your perspective, fighting for something. Yes. But uh, we have a tradition of Mormon stories of ending by having people bear their testimony. <laughs> so uh, it's it's now that time. Okay. If you had to look the camera in the eye and bear your testimony to our listeners, <laughs> and it can be not only about Christianity, but just about what you've learned in life, what you value, the truths that are most important to you. Anything about Gerald you want to say? Now's your, <laughs> now's your moment. I believe truth matters. Uh, I believe God matters. I believe Christianity is true. I believe in the grace of Christ, that everything that needed done was taken care of in Christ. I can't add to that. And the Mormons will say, what about good works? I believe my life shows a life of good works. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I do have coffee. Uh, but, but I do those kinds of things. I go to church, I have devotions. But that, that's just a part of being a Christian. Christianity is saying, I'm a sinner, I can't make it on my own. I'm sure glad someone else took care of this because I'm a mess up. And I come to the foot of the cross, I give it all to Christ. Take my life and make what you want out of it because I, I don't have zip idea where I'm going with all this. And I believe that God guides my life. I believe he answers my prayers, that he is touching my life. I believe he brings me joy every day. Uh, the whole experience with Gerald was a time of seeing God's grace and all that, not of saying, why me? or being angry about it. And I don't have the answers to why everybody has illnesses or why certain kids suffer and 
uh, other people don't, you know, I don't know. But I know that in the midst of whatever we've gone through, and there have been other situations in my life too that were very trying, uh, but I believe the grace of God was there to take me through. I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm not the smartest person in the world. Uh, and there's plenty of places you can poke holes in me. But it's not about me. It's about Christ. And if you go back and you read the New Testament, I think you see a beautiful offer of God's grace that says you're, you're always going to be short. You're always going to be in the deficit column. That's why I had to do it all for you. And I accept that atonement so that that brings me into a relationship with Christ that calls me into a life of holiness, that calls me into a life that wants to please God. It's just like in a marriage. Uh, you serve your wife. You do those things that make her happy because you love her, not because of a list of rules. At least it shouldn't be. But it's through that love response. And so I respond to God's forgiveness by showing my love in an act of a life of service and trying to live a holy, godly life. I think everyone would be benefited by that, even outside of eternal life. I think that if you, when you find grace in Christ, it takes away so much of the anxiety of the performance of life. I trust the Bible. I believe in the New Testament. I believe that uh, there really was a Jesus. There really were apostles, and they really walked Jerusalem. <laughs> and so that's my testimony. I believe there is a God. I believe he answers prayer. I believe he's answered my prayers. I believe I've had healings. And uh, it's too late in this program to even touch on that, but, I mean, I believe I've seen God touch my life at times when I can look at that and say, yes, that was the hand of God. Final thoughts on Gerald? Gerald was a recluse. He was um, not socially adept, a uh, stickler for honesty. Uh, a very strong moral tone, almost sometimes to the point of exasperation. Um, he would not jaywalk in front of this building. He would have to go to the corner. <laughs> he wouldn't let me put Jesus stickers on the back of my car because I don't, didn't always keep the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> he says, until you promise me you're going to keep every rule on the road, I don't want to see a sticker on that car. So we don't have stickers. <laughs> and if you could see him now, what would you say to him? I'd say I love you, and I miss him. Uh, when someone dies, when a mate dies, you can stay busy during the day, but when it catches up to you is when you go to bed at night, and there's no one next to you to hug. And that's when it's really lonely. So I miss him. <laughs> You're going to see him again? I'm going to see him. Mm -hmm. Well, Sandra Tanner, thank you so much for joining us on Mormon Stories. Okay. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's been an evening. <laughs> Find that successor. Yeah. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Well, God will show up uh, with the right guys here someday, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to end. I'll just turn around to the camera. We have to end by me. Oh, it's well, right. Yeah, I can, um, Wait. <laughs> we have to end by me trying to lift the golden plates. So we've got a copy of them here. And these are the golden plates. That, uh, I guess it's a model of the golden plates <laughs> that Joseph Smith would have carried for many miles, and Moroni too. And all I can say is it's extremely heavy. Yeah, so 118 ever, pounds. <laughs> 118 pounds? Yeah. So if you ever come to Utah Lighthouse Ministry, pick up these things, it'll make you... Think something about the golden place. Yeah. <laughs> what that is, that's up to you. Anyway, thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> On more of the stories. Take care.
Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy when your way. Though hard to you this journey may appear, grace shall be as your day. to drive to the sand your hearts will swell